Welcome, Cinephiles, to another episode of Frame by Frame, a series dedicated to the craft of filmmaking. Today, we're going to talk fantasy. It's a genre that relies on illusions, illusions created with techniques like forced perspective, an optical trick that, when done correctly, can give a normal man the appearance of a giant or a halfling. He's an angry elf. It's so effective, in fact, that it's been used to create the worlds of Game of Thrones, Harry Potter, and The Lord of the Rings. But how's this cinematic sorcery achieved? Well, put down your map to Mount Doom, Gandalf. All I need for this first demonstration is one Jon Snow, one direwolf, and a camera. So before we start, let's define forced perspective. It's an optical illusion that makes objects appear smaller or larger than they really are. But how is this accomplished? Well, check out this shot from Game of Thrones. Ghost, John's direwolf, saunters over to greet his master. Now it looks like John and his pup are face to face, right? Wrong. John is actually seated several feet behind his wolf. But let's take a look at this from a bird's eye view. As you can see, Ghost is also blocked closer to the lens. Therefore, to our eyes, Ghost appears much larger than a normal wolf given his relative size to John. The depth between them, however, is hidden by the composition. Now is this done solely through blocking? No way. Eye lines play a big part as well. On set, Kit Harington, who plays Jon Snow, would be given a mark so that his eye line would match ghosts. That way, to the viewer, each appears to be looking at the other. When in reality, both Kit and Ghost are staring off into space. Which also means Kit isn't petting Ghost here either, he's just miming the action. Now to clarify, this may be a VFX shot. Even if it is though, you could still create the same image, the same composition, by utilizing the methods we just covered. But that's just a simplified explanation of the technique. In practice, both lighting and depth of field need to be carefully calculated to pull the gimmick off. In terms of lighting, the background object needs to be much more brightly lit than the foreground object to compensate for light fall off. How much brighter though is determined by the inverse square law. But the angle of the light on the background object also has to match that on the foreground subject. This way each appears to be lit by the same source, as they would be if they were actually near one another. Next, let's talk depth of field with a forced perspective example from Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. Dear fellow, however did you manage to kill it? Kill it? Eldest friend he was. To get this shot, Harry and Professor Slughorn were blocked several feet behind Hagrid on set. Yet, as you can see, everyone's in focus. This is accomplished by a wide depth of field. For those of you who look puzzled right now, depth of field is defined as the distance between the nearest and furthest objects in an image that appear in acceptable focus. Widening depth of field is all about lens choice and stopping your camera's aperture down. And a wide depth of field is key for forced perspective shots. You see, if Hagrid is in sharper focus than Harry, our eyes will perceive Harry is further away. This is because objects that are further away from our eyes are typically blurrier than objects closer to them. To calculate how much space you'll have to work with given your setup though, you'll need to consult a depth of field chart. Or just take that nightmare and hand it to your cinematographer. I I'd recommend that. Now, forced perspective can be created in a number of other ways than composition or lighting. Throughout the Harry Potter series, for example, the art department made duplicate props of differing sizes. Just take a look at Harry's birthday cake here. Got something for you. Fred, I know you've sat on it at some point, but I imagine it'll taste fine just the same. Ah. Baked it myself, words and all. Okay, so let's break that down. A miniature box was made for Hagrid to hold. That way it looks tiny in the giant's hands. Next, the art team made a second, larger box for Harry to hold. The audience, however, thinks the box's size remains constant. So when it looks small in Hagrid's hands, we think it's because he's a giant. And when the box seems huge in Harry's hands, we think it's because he's just that much smaller than Hagrid. Now, the Game of Thrones team relies on VFX compositing and scaling for most effect shots, but their crew employs a similar trick in the design of their giants. Perfect. 
You see, their costume department fashions foam suits that are wider at the base than they are at the top, which means the actors wearing them have small foam heads and big foam feet. Now this is because the giants are often shot in low angles to exaggerate their size. So we the viewers see giant feet and a tiny noggin. And what do our brains interpret that to mean? That the distance from the giant's feet to their head is greater than it really is, which further supports their seemingly incredible height. Pretty mind-melting stuff, huh? Okay, maybe not that mind-melting, until you ask yourself this. How do you pull off a forced perspective shot with a moving camera? Don't worry, you can put the calculator down, Peter Jackson's got the solution. Just thank his visual effects team on The Lord of the Rings. They innovated a way to make the effect work with moving sets. Just check out this shot of Gandalf and Frodo. In the fires of Mount Doom, taken by Isildur from the hand of Sauron himself. Elijah Wood is blocked several feet behind Ian McKellen here, but you know that. You also know that their eye lines are adjusted to hide this fact. but. The camera's dollying, so why don't we see the true depth between them? Well, you see this table? It's cut in half. The half McKellen is on is attached to a dolly. Frodo is pouring tea for Gandalf at a table, and the camera kind of crabs past from one side of the table to the other side. And in that instance, Ian McKellen was actually sitting on a dolly that was actually moving him slightly on a small scale table. One that's electronically synchronized to mirror the camera dolly's movements, only in reverse. So the camera moves this way and the set moves that way, which keeps our perspective intact even though the camera's moving. Why? Because everything's moving in relation to one another. The table's also constructed and framed to look like one piece of furniture while it's in motion. Also note how there's similar props on both sides of the table as well, except on Gandalf's side, these props are smaller than those on Frodo's end, which makes Gandalf seem larger than the Hobbit in relation to equivalent items. Now, imagine the logistics of shooting setups like this for three separate movies, or six if you want to include the Hobbit. <laughs> Don't worry, I'd cry too, Sam. There you go. Force perspective, a staple technique of the fantasy genre, one that's made the unbelievable believable long before the advent of CGI. And whether it's accomplished through blocking, scaling props, or moving sets, force perspective is a powerful tool in the filmmaker's arsenal. Maybe not as powerful as a giant arrow, okay, definitely not as powerful as a giant arrow, but hey. You get the point. Thank you for watching, ladies and gentlemen, and make sure to subscribe to this channel, Film Theory, for more fantastic film-related content. If you'd like to watch more Frame by Frame, click the frame to the left to watch an episode on the visual direction behind Mad Max. Or if you'd like to check out a Film Theory episode on Game of Thrones, click the frame to the right. And until next time, my name is Kyle, and this has been Frame by Frame.